For paper two, I'm going to go through quite a few um, topics. The first topic I'm going to look at is VAT. Now, VAT is a paper two concept. Please note that VAT is 15%, okay? So VAT is 15%. A very, very popular VAT question is calculate the amount that is payable to SARS for the two-month period ended 30 April. So remember, we either have to pay SARS or SARS owes us money. So it's either the amount payable to SARS or the amount due from SARS. So here you can see that we still owe SARS some money. And so the information presented to us here is related to VAT. So here they say VAT related transactions for the period ended 30 April. So all of this will be VAT related amounts, but they are all not necessarily VAT. If you look at this, this is the balance due by SARS balance due by SARS. Okay, so please just note that and I'll explain what that is on the 1st of April. And then it says purchases of trading stock excluding that. So that is the amount excluding that. So you still have to work out the VAT. Cash and credit sales including that. So that includes that. And then here, all these amounts, it says VAT on drawings, VAT on returns, VAT on discount. So this is the VAT. So it's very important to ask yourself, is this the VAT? Is this the amount including VAT or is this the amount excluding VAT? And it will be very, very clear in the activity. But before I get to the activity, let me explain to you how to work out the VAT um, due by or the VAT due to SARS. Okay, so I'm going to use a blank page and I'm going to use the explanation. I like to use the explanation of the organization. So there we go. That is our business. Okay, whatever they sell. My arrow is processes or goods coming in to the business, okay? So this arrow shows processes or goods coming into the business. This arrow here is processes. What I mean by processes, it could be services render or, that's goods, or goods flowing out of the business, okay? So that's a very good example. My Processes or goods flowing into the business is what we call VAT input. And my processes or goods flowing out of the business, that is called my VAT output. Okay? Now, I'm going to do this now. You can see that. I'm going to show it in a T account. So there I have my VAT account. Okay? So I'm going to use a different color pen. That is my VAT account there. You can see I'm using a blue pen. My output will make what I owe SARS more, and my input will make what I owe SARS less. So what would my output be? If goods are flowing out of the business, then my output will be sales, whether it's cash or credit. So my cash or credit sales will be an output because goods are flowing out of the business, okay? What would my input be? Before I can sell my items, I have to buy it. So my input will be my purchases. And that will be purchases cash or credit. So if you look at just goods, right, in this case, then it's easy to argue what your inputs and outputs are. Before you can calculate the amount due to SARS, you have to understand the difference between output VAT or VAT output or output tax and input VAT, 
Okay, you have to understand the difference between the two. Input is stuff coming into the business, therefore it's purchases. Output is stuff flowing out of the business, therefore it is sales. Now, your understanding is based on this. Therefore, let's look at some more inputs and outputs. I'm going to use some examples. What would returns from debtors be? Returns from debtors. Now, remember, you sell to a debtor on credit. So there's sales. So your returns from debtors will be an input. So returns from debtors will be an input based on the fact that sales to debtors is an output. What will your returns to creditors be? Okay, I bought on credit. So I'm now returning to my creditors. So returns, um, sorry, to creditors will be an input. It's not really it's an input. It's just a cancellation of the output. So you just put it on the opposite side. What would drawings be? Okay, think about it. I bought the items cash or credit. The owner is taking it for his own use. So therefore, drawings would be an output. Why? If you think about it, when the owner takes good goods, the goods move out of the business. OK, so it's going out. If you think of returns to creditors, I bought the items on credit from a creditor. The stuff came in. Now I'm returning it. It's going out. If you think of Returns from debtors, when I sold to debtors, the, the items flowed out of my business. Now, the debtors are returning the items back in. Okay, so you just say, is the items flowing in or is the items flowing out? Let me just put some bullet points here so that you can see what I'm talking about. Let's use another example. What about payments of expenses? Remember, I said processes in, so payments of expenses will be an input that. So input that is what you can claim back from SARS against your outputs. OK, so expenses can be claimed back from SARS because of my outputs. Therefore, it is important that a person becomes a VAT vendor because they can claim the VAT back on the expenses and they can claim the VAT back on their fixed assets purchased. Okay, so that is how you understand whether it's VAT input or output. Let's look at the fixed assets purchased. What is happening? Is the fixed assets coming into my business? Yes, I'm buying a computer, so a computer is coming in. Okay, I'm buying a vehicle, so a vehicle is coming in. I'm paying for my expenses. The expenses, the processes is flowing into the business. The ones that cause a lot of confusion is the discount. OK, so where would I put discount received and discount allowed? Think about it this way. I allow my discount to my data. I sold on credit. I'm going to put here data so you can understand i sold on credit to a debtor and i charged him that on the full amount that i um sold uh, to the data now i am allowing that data a discount so i'm now going to reverse that portion of that on the discount so discount allowed will be on this side And if I think of discount received from a creditor, I, pour, I bought on credit from a creditor, okay? That creditor, um, the input VAT is the full amount of the purchase. Now the creditor gives me a discount, so I must cancel the amount of the full amount. So it's discount received. And if you can argue it around sales and purchases and try and understand what's going on, then you will know how to do that. So the first thing you must understand is 
input VAT and output VAT. And why it's input and why it's output? It's on the goods I buy that comes into my business and the goods that I sell that flows out of my business. Based on that, I can now identify my input and my output. My output makes the amount that I owe to SARS more. Okay, so I owe SARS more. The input makes what I owe to SARS less because I can claim this back. Now, based on that, I argue whether items are flowing in or whether it's flowing out. So, once I know my input and my output, now I can look at this year and identify what is input and what is output. So let's put this on. Let's put this on. This is from the 2022 paper. I neglected to explain that. I do apologize. It's from the 2022 May-June paper. Okay, so this is from the May-June 2022 paper and it's freely available on the DBE website. So you can go and download that paper there. So here we go. Now I have to calculate the amount that I owe to SARS. Now I must ask myself, based on this, is it an input or an output? And then I'm going to do my calculation. So purchases, what will purchases be? An input VAT. What will sales be? Output, based on the understanding now. What did I say will drawings be? Will drawings be an input to an output? Drawings will be an output because I bought the items and now the owner is taking it out of the businesses, business. Returns from debtors. I sold to debtors. It was an output. Now the returns becomes an input. And then discount received from my suppliers. Another word for suppliers is a creditor. So if you think about it, I bought from my creditor on credit, okay, it was an input. Now I'm receiving a discount, so it becomes an output. Oops, see that bit. So purchases input, sales output, drawings output because the items are going out, returns from debtors, the stuff is coming back in, discount received, what happened was I purchased, the purchase is an input, the discount then becomes an output because I'm claiming back or I'm reversing that portion of discount on the discount receipt. Oh, sorry, the portion of that on the discount receipt. Now that we know that, our calculation can become easier. Let's do this again. We can either do it as a T account. If you're still a bit confused, then you do it as a T account. That is out, that is in, that is plus, that is minus. All my outs are going to be pluses, all my ins are going to be minuses. So I'm going to show you the two ways in which you can do that. Okay? That's the step number two. Step number three is identifying or calculating the VAT only on this portion and that portion. This is the VAT already. So you don't have to calculate anything because they say VAT on, VAT on, VAT on. So if something excludes VAT, it is 100%. If an amount includes VAT, it is 115%. So inclusive of VAT is always 115. Exclusive of VAT is always 100. And learners, you know my calculation is what you want over what you have. Okay, so let's do that calculation very, very quickly. Okay, so in the first instance, I have 59,000. I, that is 100% because it is VAT exclusive. I want the 15%. So what I want over what I have. I have the 100% and I want the 15%. And that amount there is 8850. So that's 8850. Okay. If I take my calculator and just verify that 59,000 times 15% is 8850 indeed. So that amount is correct. Then the second amount, remember this, is X VAT. Okay. Therefore, it is 100 or 15 over 100. The next amount is inclusive of that, 87,400 is inclusive of that, 
115, I want the 15 over the 115, okay, because that is inclusive of that. And the inclusive of that amount is always the 15, uh, the 115%. So it's 87,400 times 15 times 15 divided by 115, and I get 11,400 Rand. So that's 11,400 Rand. And there I have my VAT amounts. They will always test this, whether you can convert the VAT or calculate the VAT on an exclusive of VAT amount, whether you can calculate the VAT on the inclusive of VAT amount. Okay, now I'm going to do my calculation. I'm going to do it very, very quickly in the VAT control account. Right, I'm going to do it very quickly in the VAT control account, simply because I want to show you the two ways to work it out. So, it says here, balance due by SARS. It means that SARS owes that amount to me, so it's 2,600. That's my balance brought down. Balance due by SARS is a debit balance. Balance due to SARS is a credit balance. So the 2,600 goes on there. All my inputs are going to come on this side. Okay, so there, I'm not going to put down the 59. I'm going to put down the 8850. OK, and when you're doing a tier account learners, you don't have to write a description here. You simply write the amount because they're asking you to calculate. OK, so you're doing it as a calculation. Then that's my out and my out is 11,400 there. OK, so that's what I calculate for 11,400. Then that's another out, 1,200. That's an in 2820 and that's an out 3360. So please identify whether it's in or out, okay? And then you simply copy it down based on what you've identified. So I'm going to add up my bigger side and I'm going to minus my smaller side. And the amount due to SARS is 1690. So add up my bigger side, that plus that plus that, minus, 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 which is my smaller side, and I owe SARS 1690. I can show it like this in my answer, or I can show it as follows. Okay, now I'm going to follow the same principle of in and out. Okay, so you can do it this way. I'm going to start with my 2600. Why am I starting it as a negative? Because it's a debit. This is the more difficult way. I'm going to show you another way to do it. Okay. Then I'm going to copy down my, my calculations. That is a further negative, the 8850. Remember, it was also an input. Then I'm going to add my 11,400 because I know that that is an output. So that's, that there's a debit balance. That there's an input. That there's an output. Okay, my next is my 1,200, which is also an output as per my, um, my I looked at it and I saw that it's an, an output. And now I'm going to minus my 2820, okay, and I'm going to plus my 3360. So that there is going to be an input and that there is going to be an output. So that is how you can do it. And then it gives you an answer of one. 690. That for me is a difficult calculation. This is how I like to do it. I say balance. Now I know my balance is a minus 2600. I know it because it's a debit balance. Then I go and I add up all my outputs and I add up all my inputs. Okay, so now I'm going to say all my outputs I'm going to put together 11400 and my 1200 and my 3,360, and then I'm going to put my two inputs together, 8850, and my 8, no, 2820. Okay, I should have actually moved that over, minus 2600. Learners, I like to do it this way, because now I'm separating my outputs I'm adding all my outputs together. I'm adding all my inputs together. Okay. Now I go and I say 11, 4, 
plus 1, 2, plus 3, 3, 6, oh, is 15,960. Oh. The only difference here is 8850 oh, plus 2820. Oh. I know that my, I think I made a mistake somewhere. I didn't, it's 8850, oh, sorry. 8850 oh, plus 2820 oh, is, I know that my input is a negative. 11,670. So now I say that's my debit balance. Okay, my debit balance is negative 2,600. And I must just try and figure that out on this calculator. 2,600, I'm going to plus 15,960 and I'm going to minus 11,670 and I get that answer there. I think I... I didn't add it properly, but that's the answer I get. Okay, so there's many ways to do this, learners, but this for me is the easier way. Thank you, and that is how to calculate that. The next topic is creditors' reconciliation. Once again, I'm getting the information out of the 2022 May-June paper, so please go and download this paper so that you can work through this together with the video. Okay, we have a situation here where we have Marnie Supermarket owned by Marnie Bloom. The business buys goods on credit from Laws Wholesalers. So Laws Wholesalers is our creditor and our creditor will send us a statement every month. We are Marnie Supermarket. In our books, we will have the creditor's ledger and we will compare the creditor's ledger with a statement received from Laws Wholesalers. So once again, let's do a quick journey down memory lane. Okay, so on the one hand, I'm going to pull a line down the middle here and I'm going to write Marnie Wholesalers there and I'm going to write Laws Supermarket there. Okay, so that's Laws, that's Marnie. That is us. That is them. We get our statement from them. So that will be the statement. Okay. And in our books, we have the creditor's ledger. So what you must understand about the two is that the statement is plus minus because in the books of laws, we, us, money, is a debtor. So it will be plus minus. But when we look at laws, it will be minus plus, okay? Because it's a creditor's ledger. So there, the creditor will be a liability minus plus. But in their books, we will be an asset because we owe them money. So that is the first point of departure that you need to understand, okay? Is that we see each other differently. Then what you need to know is when it comes to comparing the statement to the ledger, you compare pluses to pluses and you compare minuses to minuses. Okay, so pluses to pluses, this is not double entry, eh? this is mirror imaging. And you compare minuses to minuses. So what are your pluses? Your pluses are, and I'm just going to draw my line further down, make my line further down there, so that I can tell you what my pluses are. My pluses on this side is invoices. So an invoice is always a plus, and there will also be invoice, okay? So we will receive an invoice from laws, and they will record on their plus side, on their debit side, and we will record on our plus side, our credit side. They will record on the debit side to show that we owe them, and we will record on our credit side to show that we owe them. Then what will be the minus? The most important minus is your EFT. In other words, we will pay them, okay? So we will pay them. So an EFT will be a minus. When we pay them, 
via EFT, they issue a receipt. Remember, they also have documents, we EFT, and they issue us with a receipt. Then we also have returns. We buy from them, but we also return to them. The returns will be minuses, minuses. Okay, so returns will always be minuses. Invoices is here on this side, they sell to us and we buy from them. So when they say an invoice for goods purchased from laws, it will always be from our point of view. So they'll use the word purchase from laws is an invoice. So please note when they use the word purchases, they are talking about invoices. And then when we look at returns on our side, on our side, it will be a debit note, but on their side, it will be a credit note. So please note that debit notes and credit notes refers to returns. Maybe you want to pause here just to understand, okay, what I'm trying to explain. And then finally, what will also make our account increase is when they charge us interest. Okay, on overdue account, then we will owe them more. And what will also make our account decrease, just want to put bullet points here so you can see it's different points. What will also make our account decrease is discount received. And what will they do? They will allow us a discount. So there it will be discount allowed. Okay, so those are the points that you must consider when reading. When you read and you say an invoice, then you must know it's a plus. When they say an EFT, you must know it's a minus. Okay, so that, if you understand that, then part of this work will become very, very easy. So what is the first thing I would do if I should get an activity like this in the exam. This is such a nice activity. This is out of the May, June 2022 paper. The first thing I will do is I will read what this um, information is and it's the creditor's ledger. Okay, so I underline the word creditor's ledger and the creditor's ledger will always be minus plus. That's important to know. So that when you're going to show your pluses and minuses later on, it's going to be easy. Then I'm going to go and I'm going to look at this here. It's the statement. So the statement is always plus minus. Okay, so now you've learned. The statement is always plus minus and the ledger is always minus plus. Now I am going to compare pluses to pluses and minuses to minuses. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to look to see what this information is. And I just want to show you here. Here's information of the 28th and the 29th. So I'm just going to rule a line through. Oh, I'm going to draw a block around here. Okay, I'm going to draw a block around there and I'm going to draw a block around there. Why am I drawing a block? Just to show you that the statement closed off at the end of March. It closed off with the same balance that I started out with. Okay, so I'm really going to start to compare from this way down. So I'm going to complete pluses to pluses, minuses to minuses, and then they must give me some information with regards to that because this is still from last month. Remember that they will still correct some things from last month. The other thing I want to point out is my creditor's ledger ends on the 29th, okay? 29th. So look at this date here. The statement ends on the 25th. So all the transactions after the 25th will not be on the statement. Okay, it's in my books, but not on the statement. Just remember that 
for later on. So can we compare? Okay, now I'm going to look. 7,800, if I don't have it, then I leave it. Okay, I don't tick it off. 640, I don't have, so I leave it. I don't tick it off. 11,400, no, I don't tick it off. And 12,800, so none of the information that's here is on this side. Now I'm going to check. 14,620, there's that EFT. Okay, so there's that EFT and there's that EFT. So I can tick that off. And that seems to be about it. I don't have any of this information on the side. Not at all. And I, don't, I only have the 14,620 on either side. I have none of the other information. So that I now need to follow to see why all of this information is not in either of the books. That should be, if everything is recorded, it should be in the respective books. Okay, so let's read. Now we're going to read carefully. We're going to go down, sorry, we're going to go down and we're going to read carefully. Now learners, now you need to pay attention. A comparison of the statement received from laws with the ledger Reveal, reveal the following differences. Now let's look at the differences. Marnie's supermarket was granted an allowance of 750 for inferior quality goods received during March, received during last month. This transaction was not recorded by the bookkeeper of Marnie. Okay, so there's our 750 and that was a discount for inferior goods, okay? It's in the statement, but not in our books. Nowhere is there 750 here. So, what must we do with the 750? The 750, if something is in the statement, but not in our books, we put it in our books, okay? So, if it's year, but not year, it goes into our books. So, what do we do now? Let me show you. This is our books, the creditor's ledger, and this is the statement. Okay, so the 750 is not in our books, so we are going to put it in our books. What is it? It's a discount. And remember earlier on, I said to you that a discount is a minus, and so it's minus 750. Okay, we received a, an allowance. Another word for an allowance is a discount. And so therefore, another word for an allowance is a discount, and so therefore, it's a minus. Okay, because I said to you earlier on, a minus is a Discount. Another word for discount is an allowance. Let's read the next one. So, sorry, let me just go. Why aren't we putting it here? It's already there. Let's do the next one. The next one says, Laws wholesalers had erroneously. Another word for erroneously is in error. Okay? Laws wholesalers entered the penalty for late payment twice. So instead of putting it in once, they put it in twice. And that was the mistake that they made. That's number one. They will correct it on the following statement. Okay, so now there's two things that we must do. Can you see? Let me just go over here. If you can just bear with me. Thank you. Can you see the 580? So what I'm going to do is, because I've dealt with the 750, I'm going to cancel it out. Okay. Can you see the 580 there and there it's twice? Can you see the 580 here somewhere? No. So there's two things. The penalty is here but not here. So I must put it there because it's not there. But they entered it twice. So the one I'm going to put into the ledger because it's not in the ledger. And the second one I'm going to cancel in the statement because it was a mistake on the statement. 
So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to plus the 580 because it was a penalty. Another word for penalty is interest. So I'm going to add the interest or the penalty to the ledger because it's not there. But I'm going to minus the error from their books because they made a mistake. Now, I can't change it in their books, but I'm going to put it in our CRS, our Creditors Reconciliation Statement, because they are going to correct it next month. And that's how I show that one. Next one is an amount for invoice 3381 on the 3rd of April was correctly recorded in the creditor's ledger. So the amount is correct in the creditor's ledger. So there's a mistake somewhere. So let's see where the mistake is. Okay. Let's look at, there's the invoice. It says 7,800. Invoice 3381. Remember, an invoice is a plus. Okay. Now let's look how invoice 3381 was recorded here. It's invoice 3381, 8,700. So they made a mistake and they recorded too much. Too much. It's too much. Okay? It should be 7,800. It should be 7,800. It is 8,700. It is too much. So they must take away the difference. Remember, they plussed too much. An invoice is a plus, so they plus too much, so they must take away the difference. If anything is, the mistake is they made, they put too much in, then you must minus. Okay, so they made the mistake, so we must minus the difference of 900. How do we get the difference? We take 7,800, okay, and we minus the 8,700 to get the 900 difference and we must minus it there. Learners, I'm trusting that you are following. You can pause the video at any stage just to reflect on what I am saying. Then an incorrect posting of returns. What did I say returns were? Returns were a minus. An incorrect posting of the returns on the 8th of April was noted. So if I look at the returns on the 8th of April, okay, there we go. Returns, remember I said to you as a debit note, 640. 640, debit note 149 on the 8th. Credit note, so a debit note compares with a credit note, 640. Where is the error? Look at that. Returns is a minus, okay? So, they minus it, they were right. What must we do? We should have minus it, but we plus it. So, we need to get that 640 over to the other side. We made the mistake. How do we know that we made the mistake? Returns should be a minus, but your returns is a plus. So now we can see it's a mistake. So it must go to that side. So how do I get it to that side? I first put the 640 in once, which cancels out. Then I put the 640 in again. So let me show you that. Show you the T account. Okay. Creators ledger plus minus. The 640 is there. Okay. It is wrong. It should not be on that side. So my first entry of 640 is going to cancel out the mistake. State, my second entry of 640 is going to put the 640 on the right side. So I'm going to put 640 twice in my creator's ledger. Okay, I'm going to minus 640 twice. So how can I do that? Show you. I like to show it like this. I like to show minus 640, minus 640. Okay, so I do it twice. You can add it together and then you can say minus 1280. Oh. Okay. So let's move on. The next one. I'm hoping that you're still following. We're nearly there. We're nearly done. Not too long. 
invoice, you see the word invoice, you must you must see a plus in your head. Okay? Can you you remember when I wrote, read the word returns? I saw a minus in my head. Now I'm reading invoice, I'm seeing a plus in my head. In the creditors ledger was for goods purchased from a different supplier. So I, or the, the bookkeeper of the business, put the wrong invoice in the creditors ledger. They increased the wrong account. And so what's going to happen? The creditor is going to complain. And it is invoice uh, BB55. So let's look for invoice BB55. There it is, invoice BB55. They plussed it, so it's right to plus it, but it doesn't belong to this person. Okay, so how am I going to get it out of this? I'm just going to put the 11,400 on the minus side. I'm just going to minus it from Laws um, Creditors Ledger. Laws does not owe me, or I don't owe Laws that money. Okay, I put it in the wrong books. So I'm just going to simply take it and put it on that side to minus in the Creditors Ledger. That is that one. That's quite an easy one. I like this activity because it covers most of the activities or the transactions that can be covered in the section. The next one, invoice 3886 on the statement included VAT at 15%. All the goods on this invoice were zero rated. Okay, so they should never have charged VAT. Laws wholesalers will correct this next month. So the mistake was on the statement. If the mistake is on the statement, we correct the mistake on the statement. In this case, the mistake was in the ledger, so we corrected the mistake in the ledger. So let's look at the invoice quickly. Let's look at the amount of the invoice. So can you see how they can um, bring the VAT question in here as well? So the invoice there, 14,720, look at there, invoice 3886, they charged us VAT on the invoice, and what did we do? We put in invoice 3886, we put in the right amount. So I would simply take the difference between that and that, and that would be the VAT amount, okay? So there, that minus that will correct the entry. So they put in too much, on the plus side, so they must minus. Can you see too much? On the plus side, so they must minus because they made the mistake. That is correct. So we are going to minus the difference and we're going to minus 1920, which is the difference between the 14,720 and the 12,800. Okay, and there I have that one. We've got three more left, and then you can please reflect on this activity and go over it over and over again. I will show the answers later on so that you can take a photo of it so that you can practice it. The bookkeeper of Marnie Stores recorded 10% discount with the EFT um, 4 to 5. Laws indicated that the discount was not approved. So what we did, we made a mistake, we deducted 10% from the payment. But laws are saying, no, 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 they are not giving us a discount. So let's look at the information again. It's comp about comparing the information all the time. Remember, the EFT is a minus. The EFT is a minus. There, we paid that amount. But we took off the discount. Oops, let me show you there. We paid that amount, but we took off the discount. If you look at, they received the amount. So they gave us a receipt for the amount, but they did not give us a discount. So we minus that by mistake. They're not going to give us a discount. So what must we do? We must plus that back because we're never going to get the discount. We're going to show that we actually still owe them that money. So we're going to plus that back because we made the mistake. So we're going to plus back one, two, five, oh. And we made the mistake. So we're plusing back one, two, five, oops, one, two, five, oh. And then finally, the last one. Oh, I think I missed this. I made a mistake. Plus one, two, five. Oh, we've got two more 
left. My apologies for making a mistake there. Okay, two more left. I know this is a very long explanation, but just stick with me. A credit note on the statement received does not relate to Marnie Supermarket. So they issued a credit note, but it's not our credit note. It's on the statement, but it is not our credit note. This will be corrected next month. So it is this credit note. It does not relate to us. It is not our credit note. So it's never going to be in our books. So they minus it. So we must just plus it back. Okay, because it was a mistake on their behalf. Don't add it to our books or don't minus it from our books because it is not our credit note. So you're simply going to add it back, 3180, and you're going to do it in their books, 3180. And then the last one simply says the books were closed off on the and this is a very, very popular one. And a lot of people actually miss out on this. Sometimes they don't say anything. The statement was received on the 26th. Okay. So everything after the 26th will not be in the, on the statement. It will be closed off. So the statement was closed off on the 25th. Everything after the 25th, the 9,900 is in our books, will not be in their books. It's a plus 9,900, so we must plus 9,900 in their books. Okay, and so if we add all of these amounts together, my apologies, if we add that, don't forget to add that. A lot of learners forget plus, 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 plus. Sorry, I apologize. That minus, 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 plus, plus, it's going to give us 56,270. If you take that amount, where there's a minus, you're going to minus. So that minus, plus, minus, minus, don't forget, minus, plus, is going to give us 56,270. And this must balance. Okay. Please, learners, if you are going to put amounts because you're not sure, you're going to get naught because you can't ask the examiner to choose where to mark. So please be very careful when it comes to this question because if you're going to fool around with this question, you might end up getting naught. Thank you so much and please practice this question. I'm going to leave this on just for a minute or so just for you to look at the answers. Maybe you want to copy it down. Pause it here and copy it down. We are going to look at how to calculate break-even point. Now, break-even point is one of those calculations that occur in an exam time after time, okay? So, this question here is out of the May-June 2022 paper. I'm working out of the May-June, the supplementary paper that was written uh, in the middle of this year. And this question I'm getting out of this um, this paper, and I'm going to do question 2.2.1, which is calculate the break-even point for shirts. So let me show you the information. So there I have lots of information. This company, they make, or this uh, manufacturing concern, they make shirts, they make shoes, and they make ties. But they want us to calculate the break-even point for shirts okay so please be aware of the question they are asking for the break-even point for shirts so you can't work it out for anything else but shirts so what i need for my break-even point is i need fixed costs and i need my contribution so the formula for break-even point is Total fixed costs, not fixed costs per unit. Total fixed costs divide by my contribution. Now, do you remember what the contribution is? The contribution is my selling price per unit minus my variable costs per unit. So it's only my numerator. Okay, my numerator is total fixed costs and my denominator, which is under the line, is my unit. 
So now I have total over unit. Please remember that. So how do I calculate my total fixed costs? I check and I see for shirts for 2022, they ask for 2022, I don't have my total fixed costs. But what I do have is I have my fixed costs per unit. I don't need it per unit. I want total fixed costs. And then I have my units produced and sold. So if I take my total units produced and sold in this case, take that, total units produced times it by my fixed cost per unit, I'm going to get my total fixed costs. Okay, so please remember that. It's my units produced times that by my fixed cost per unit. Okay, that's how I get my total fixed costs. So let's do the calculation. I'm first going to say 22,000 times 9420 to get my numerator. And then I'm going to take my selling price per unit. Okay, so there's my selling price per unit, 360 Rand. And I'm going to minus my variable cost per unit, which is 246.60. That is how I'm going to calculate my break even. But before I do that calculation, Please know that factory overhead costs and admin costs are fixed costs, okay? You have to come into the exam prepared to know that factory overhead costs and admin costs are fixed costs. Then you must know that direct material, direct labor, and selling and distribution costs are my variable costs. Okay, so let's just look at this quickly. that. Oops, my apologies. There we go. I just want to drag that away. Let me do the calculation then. My numerator is going to be calculated. I'll just do a soft calculation there. I'll show you. I'll put that into my calculator. 9420 times 22,000. And that is going to give me my total fixed costs of 2,072,400. Then my denominator is going to be 360 minus my 246.60. Or you can say, you can go straight to 113.40. So you can actually show this. If you do that, you're going to get two marks there. Okay, and if you just show this amount, then you'll get two marks there. So either way, you'll get the two marks if you minus that on your calculator and put that there, or you can show it like this. So what am I going to do? I'm going to say 2,072,400 divided by 113 Rand and 40 cents. And my break even, my answer is um, that I get on my calculator is 18,000. 275,1, but I break even, I start breaking even 276. So I'm going to round this up. I'm rounding this up. Okay, so that is my answer 18,000. On the 18,276 unit, I am breaking even. So there, I am not making a loss. I am making, I start making a profit. So I just want to look at that. Okay. And a further question to this. Now, this question has not been asked in this activity, but they could ask you, will the manager or the owner be happy with the break even? Now, remember, we produced and sold 22,000 units, okay? So, let's just look at this calculation quickly. We, let me just put that in there. The question is, will the owner or manager be happy with the break-even point? What do you compare that with? I produced 
or they produced and sold 22,000 units. They told us they produced and sold 22,000 units. The break even point is 18,276. So every unit after that, they make a profit on. So they made a very, very nice profit. And I'm just going to calculate it quickly by saying that minus that. Okay, so I'm just going to say 22,000 and I'm going to minus the 18,276 and they made a profit on 3,724 units. So, how do you answer this question? The answer is, will the owner be happy with the break-even point? The answer is yes. They made a profit of, they made a profit on 3,724 units. The, and now you answer, you say, they produced and sold 22,000 and the break-even point was less, which may, means that if I produce and sell more than my break-even, I'm making a profit. If this amount is less, then I'm making a loss. So I must produce and sell more than my break-even point. This must be more than break even point and then I will make a profit. I trust that you understand how to calculate break even and how to comment on break even. So there are three methods of inventory valuation. The first is FIFO, the second is weighted average and the third is specific identification. Now you have to know all three methods going into this exam. If you went through the first set of videos that I made for paper one, there I went through FIFO and I went through weighted average. This activity that we are going to do now includes weighted average, so I'm going to do weighted average again, and then specific identification. So let's just look at the information that is presented to us. It says Roto Cookware, and this, sorry, this is taken out of the May-June 2022 paper, which is the supplementary paper that was written in May or June of this year. So please do yourself a favor and go and download this paper from the DBE website. The owner, Leratu Klo, is a, the owner of Ratu Cookware. Okay, and she sells different types of cooking pots. So the periodic inventory system is used and the pots are valued using either the weighted average or and the microwaves are valued using specific identification. So the valuation method is only when you value closing stock that you use either FIFO, weighted average, or specific identification. So here in question 3.2.1, they say calculate the value of closing stock of pots. Okay, so 3.2.1 is what we're going to do. And they're asking for the value of closing stock of pots. And we are going to use the weighted average method when we value pots, when we do the closing stock of pots. Then... They're also asking in 3.2.4, calculate the value of closing stock of microwaves. And when we do the microwaves, we are going to look at the specific identification. Please don't forget to ask yourself, so which method am I using? So they say calculate the value of closing stock of pots. Know that pots is the weighted average. When they say the value of closing stock of microwaves, know that microwaves is specific identification and you need to know the difference between the two. So let's look at the pots first, okay? So we're going to do those two questions. We're not going to look at that one now. Yeah, we're going to look at the information. Then, stock records of the pots. So to calculate the weighted average, I'm going to go over the formula again. And remember, the weighted average was asked in paper one. 
So let's just go over the formula again. Okay. The formula for weighted average, remember your numerator is the RAND value and your denominator is the number of. So the RAND value of opening stock plus purchases plus carriage on purchases minus returns over the number of opening stock plus purchases minus returns. Okay, carriage on purchases is not a number. And then you're going to get the rand per unit. So let's do that where pots are concerned. Let's look at the information presented to us. My opening stock rand value for pots is 224,000. Then my purchases will be these three added together and there's my returns. So they gave me my net purchases. Purchases minus returns gives me my net purchases. So I can also say that purchases minus returns gives me my net purchases. So what am I sitting within? Opening stock plus net purchases, plus carriage on purchases. I need to see if there's any carriage on purchases, but please know that net purchases is purchases minus returns. Okay, so they give that to us already. So now I'm going to do the following. Can you get the activity here? Here's my answer sheet. Let's look at the following here. OK, I've got as I'm going to do my numerator first. My numerator is the top amount. So let's look at the top amount first. And there we go. Closing stock of pots. I have. 224,000 is my opening stock. They give me my net purchases. So I don't have to work out purchases minus returns. So my net purchases is. 1,712,000. There don't seem to be any carriage on purchases. And now I'm going to put that over my number of opening stock is 800 plus my net purchases is 4,700 units. Okay. Once I have that, I can now do my calculation and I get a RAND value, let me just calculate that quickly, 224 plus 1,712,000. Okay, that's going to give me, divide that by 5,500, which is that plus that. It's going to give me 352 RAND per unit. So I'm going to take the 352, and the reason why I'm doing it the, the long way is because sometimes people stop there, okay? And I'm going to times it by the closing stock, the value of my closing stock. So it is not, not the value, sorry, the number of my closing stock. There we go, 980 units. So I'm going to times that by the 980 units, nine. 80 units. I'm just going to put the RAND value there, and that is going to give me my closing stock of pots 344,960. Now, remember, they asked you to do a calculation for weighted average in paper one. I'm not saying that they're not going to ask you again, but please look at FIFO and please look at specific identification more specifically. Okay, I also want to look at this question here. Lerato is unsure of how long it will take to sell a closing stock. We're going to look at that quickly. Then we're also going to look at calculate the number of missing pots because that is also a very possible question. But I rather want to look at 
the microwaves quickly. So what I can show you the difference between the microwaves, how to calculate the microwaves, and how to calculate the, um, the pots. So with the microwaves, we are now using a different method. Okay, with the microwaves, we are using the specific identification. What does that mean? It means that I look at the number of swift um, microwaves left over, and I look, look at the delta left over, and I look at it separately. So what information do we have here? For the swift, I have opening stock, 380, okay? I have purchases of the SWIFT, 750. I have sales of the SWIFT, 965. So I need to look at, can you look at the SWIFT? I buy the SWIFT for 2,800 Rand and I sell it for 4,200. So how many SWIFT microwaves do I have left? How would I calculate that? Okay. How would I calculate that is the question. Firstly, I must look at what my opening stock is, what my purchases is, and then minus my sales because I need to know how many SWIFT is left over. They don't tell me how many SWIFT items is left over. Okay. So I'm going to go and I'm going to say I started out with 380 Swift microwaves. I bought 750 Swift microwaves and I sold 965 Swift microwaves. So I have 165 left over. That is my number of units closing stock. I bought my SWIFT for 2,800, so I have 165 at 2,800, okay? So that would be the um, value of my SWIFT. That equals 462,000 Rand, okay? That is my SWIFT. Why am I doing it like that? Because I'm identifying it specifically. There's my 2,800, that is my cost price. I have 165 left over at the cost price. Let's look at the Delta. I started out with 430 Delta microwaves. I bought 600, but I returned 120, and then I sold 580. So now I must take my returns into consideration. So let's look at that quickly. So for Delta, I started out with 430 units. I bought another 600 units, but of that, I returned 120, okay? And I sold 580. So what do I have left over? I have 330 left over or on hand, okay? So that's my opening stock plus purchases, minus returns, minus sales. That tells me how many items I have left over. Okay, look at the cost price. I pay 3,200 Rand for my Delta. So I'm gonna times that by 3,200 Rand, times 3,200 Rand, and I get a Rand value of 1,056,000. I'm gonna add that plus the 1,056,000, and I'm going to get a total value of my stock on hand for my microwaves, which is 1,518,000. And that is how you look at specific identification. You look at the specific item at its specific cost price. Please do not times it by the selling price because the selling price is what I sold it for and the cost price is what my closing stock is valued at. And that is specific identification. I just want to go back to the question of the number of missing pots. Okay? I want to go back to the question of the number of missing pots. So, Let's look at that question quickly. 
My, the question is, are there really 980 pots left over? Okay, are there really 980 pots left over? How am I going to determine that? How am I going to determine that? I started out with 800 pots. Then I bought another 4,700 pots, okay? That gives me a total of 5,500 pots in total. I sold 400, 4,720. So let me just show you that calculation quickly because this is where a lot of learners also struggle. You must look at it very kind of um, logically. You must look at it very logically. Sorry, I must just put the other one up. Calculate the number of missing pots. It's 3.2.1. I started out with 800 pots, okay? Let's look at the numbers. Then I bought another 4,700 pots. So I had in total available to sell 5,500 pots. I sold 4,270 pots. So if I take 5,500 and I minus 4,270, I should have had and I should have had 1,230 pots left over. So, opening stock plus purchases minus sales. If there were returns, I would have taken away the returns, but that is my net purchases. So, that's opening stock plus net purchases, which is purchases minus returns anyway, okay? And that is sales. So, I should have had 1,230 pots left over, but I only have 980. So, I take what I should have had left over and I minus my physical count. So, that is my book value, remember, minus my physical count. And I have a trading stock deficit of 250 missing pots. Okay, so don't forget that. That's opening stock plus purchases minus returns minus sales. Tells me what I should have left over. Then I look at what I actually have left over according to my stock records. Okay, according to my stock records, they say I have 980 left over. And then I can see that I have 250 missing pots. Very, very important question. And the last question I'm going to deal with is, Lerato is unsure how long it will take to sell the closing stock. Okay, so what calculation would that be? Please remember, when you are busy with stock, please study your number of days stock on hand, or please remember your rate of stock turnover. So what they're actually asking here is for the number of days, okay, stock will be on hand, how long it will take for her to sell her stock, how many days will it take for her to sell her stock. Now, the calculation for number of days stock on hand, okay, that is what we're looking at because they're asking for how long it will take to sell how long it will take to sell. So that's a different way of putting that calculation. If I look at stock on hand, then I put closing stock on top and I put cost of sales at the bottom because my stock, if you hold your hand open, okay, like, you, like you're cupping your hand, like you're receiving something from someone, then your stock is on your hand, on the top of your hand, Okay, and your cost of sales is at the bottom. If you turn it around, stock turn over, and I'm hoping that you can understand my explanation. Now you have the back of your hand up. Okay, you can see your nails now, your, your back of your hand up. So stock turn over is cost of sales on top and your hand, okay, the, the palm of your hand is now at the bottom. And that is how you can work out number of days stock is on hand, it is 
in the palm of your hand. So stock is on top. So now I have my closing stock, which I worked out there, 344. So you use that same closing stock there. Okay, 960, and you put it over your your cost of 1,591,040. And I'll tell you where you got that from. That amount you got from there. They say cost of sales must 1,091,040. So there they give you the cost of sales. Okay, because you want to know how long you're going to time the number of days as number of days. Is, and we're going to get 79,1 days. So it's going to take her 79,1 days to sell her, hand, her stock. Okay. The question there is, is it acceptable? Isn't it not acceptable? And you must look for information which is going to tell you whether it's acceptable or not. Learners, I can already tell you that inventory valuation will be in your exam on Friday. This little video is going to look at the debtors collection schedule and the creditors payment um, schedule. Okay, so we're going to look at how we calculate certain information in the debtors collection schedule. Now, I'm not only going to calculate the missing amounts, I'm also going to prove to you how these amounts were calculated and how these amounts were calculated, because remember, the, a question exactly like this will not appear in your paper. So I want to equip you as thoroughly as possible so that you will be able to calculate these amounts if one of it is not given. So let's look at um, one of these amounts. I'm going to look at either May or June because the information is given. Okay, I can even look at July to see how one of these amounts were calculated. And then what I want to, you to do is, once you are, when you're watching the video, you've downloaded the paper, okay? Now you're watching the video, and now I want you to go and play around to find these amounts. But let me show you how these amounts were calculated. So I'm only going to concentrate, uh, let's just look at the question because I'm answering the question. It says, complete the debtors collection schedule for July, okay? June was given, but I'm going to show you how they calculated the June amounts. Then they say payments to can't calculate, payments to creditors in July. So they only want in July, and now they give you the information with regards to sales and purchases. Sales will be to uh, debtors and purchases to creditors. But here they are giving us total sales. So total is cash and credit. You must remember that when you are doing the debtors collection schedule, you cannot use total. You must find credit sales. So now they give us credit sales for May, for June, and for July. Okay, they've given us the credit sales, so we don't have to calculate it. But I just want to show you if they perhaps ask you to calculate it, how to calculate it. Now they say credit sales amounts to 60% of total sales. So I'm going to take 60% of that, and that's going to form my credit sales for May. I'm going to take 60% of that, that's going to form my credit sales for June, and 60% of that, and that's going to form my credit sales for July. So, let me show you the answer sheet. They've already given it, but let's just calculate this one here, just to show you. My May total sales is 962,500. If I times that by 60%, okay, so let's just do the calculation, 962,500 times that by 60%, and yes, I get 577,500. So if one of these amounts are missing, that is how you're going to calculate it. Total sales times my credit sales percentage. Okay, now they say, that is just one of it, you can go and test the others to see that you do get that information. Now, what is really, really important is this part. Debtors pay according to the following trends. 40% is 
in the month of the sale. So they have given us sales for April, sales for May, that's credit sales, credit sales for June, and credit sales for July, okay? That is my budgeted period. My budgeted period is May, June, July. But I'm still going to get in money in my budgeted period from April sales. So how do I make sense of this? 40% comes in in the same month of the sale, 45% the month following the month of the sale, and 12% two months after that. So if I'm going to use the example, 40% of April sales will come in in April because it comes in in the same month. Then 45% will come in in May and 12% will come in in June. And so here for May, I'm just going to say May, June, July. Okay? For June, I'm going to say June, July, August. For July, I'm going to say July, August, September. So, your starting point is very important. If they say 40% in the month of the sale, then that 40 comes in in that same month. Okay, so on this side, the 40 is going to come in in May. And then it follows on 45 in June and 12 in July. 40% comes in in June. So your starting point is very important. Please practice that. And this is just a rough example to explain to you how all of this works. Okay, so let me go to this thing. How does this work on this sheet? If I look at April, okay, I look at April, 40% comes in in April. 45% in May and 12% in June. So that's the 12% from April that's coming in in June. If I take this amount and times it by 12%, I'm going to get that amount there. Okay, so if that amount is given and you must work out that, then you say April, May, June and the 12% comes in in June. If I go May, June, July, so why am I going May? Because 40% comes in in May. I don't need May. 45 of that amount, 45 comes in in June, okay? And the rest, the 12% comes in in July. Yeah, I'm going to do it again. June, July, August. What do I need? I just need June and July. So 40%, okay, 40%, but there's a disclaimer here with a 40%, okay? There's a disclaimer with a 40%. 40% in the month of the sale subject to a 5% discount. Don't forget that. So 40% comes in. 40% of June comes in in June. 40% of June comes in in June minus 5. Okay, so I'm going to put minus 5 in brackets because I'm going to show you how to calculate it. So, look at it here. 40, 45, 12. So, can you see that the 40, 45, 12 is in reverse? Let's look at it here very quickly. If you look at it down... Oopsie, I apologize. Okay. If you look at it down, there's 40, 45, 12. I'm going to talk about the three later on. But what does it look like on the debtors collection schedule? It looks like this. 40, 45, 12. Okay. So what do you think this is going to look like? That's 40 minus 5, 45, and 12. So that is what it's going to look like there. Okay, you can also see 12, 12, 45, 45, 40, 40. And because it's collected over three months, there's only going to be three amounts per column. 
So let me show you how to calculate. So you say 12% of that is 68,040. 45% of that is 259,875. But this amount here, how would I calculate that amount? I take my 598,500 and I times it by 40% first. Okay? I times it by 40% first. I don't times it by 35%, so 598, 500 times 40%, and I'm going to get 239,400. Now I'm going to times that by 95%, because I get a 5% discount. In other words, a 100 minus 5 gives me 95. So I'm only going to receive sorry, I give a 5% discount, I'm only going to receive 95% of that, okay? And that's where I get my 227430, okay? So, can we work out the rest for seven marks? So, I'm going to say 12% of that, okay? 577500 times 12%, and... Just want to use a different color pen so that you don't become confused. 12% of that, and my answer is 69,300. Okay, then I'm going to say 45% of that, 45% of that, and I'm going to get 269,325. Please calculate it for yourself so that you can see the amount. How am I gonna calculate this learners, okay? I'm going to say 609 times 40%. Then the answer I get, I times by 95. So let's do that calculation very quickly. Let's do that calculation very quickly. I'm just gonna find an open space, right? It is 609 times 40% First, okay, 609, and you can do the calculation in one step. You don't have to write down the answer times 40%, and you get 243,600, and now you times that by 95%, and you're going to get 231,420. 231420, and that you're going to put in here, 231420. And then you add the three together, that plus that plus that, and you get a part mark just for adding the amounts together. There we go. So that is your debtor's collection schedule. I hope you understand. Please rewind if you don't understand. What is the key here? The key is to read. 40% in the month of the sale. So 40% of May will come in in May and then June, July. 40% of June will come in in June. Obviously, you're going to minus the 95%. Uh, uh, sorry, the 5%. Okay, you're going to minus it. Don't forget to do that. So then 40 in June, July, August. July, 40, August, September. So you have to understand how that works. Let's look at payments to creditors. Now, this one here, they only ask for one month and it's for four marks. So let's look at the information that they give us. They say that from this point on here, oh, sorry, let me just talk about the written off. The written off does not go into the cash budget. So you are working out here money from debtors because you're busy with the cash budget. The written off will go into your projected income statement. So you simply ignore this unless they ask you to calculate the amount written off, but that will not go in your cash budget. So you simply ignore the written off amount for the, um, for the debtor's collection schedule. You don't calculate it. Okay, so the markup is 75%. Stock is replaced in the same month of the sale. 
a base stock is maintained. 80% of the stock is cash, and therefore 20% will be credit. Okay? Remember, credit will be creditors. So, I want to work out the 20% because the 20% of my purchases relates to creditors. Creditors are paid in the second month after the purchase. So, that's a lot of information. So, what am I saying here or what are they saying to me? Let me explain that to you quickly. Sorry, let me use this amount. Let me use this here so I can read the question. If I look at my trading stock account, remember, I'm looking at payments to creditors. They say a base stock level is maintained. So it doesn't matter what your base stock level is. What they are saying is, if I start out with 10,000 rands with a stock, I finish off with 10,000. If I start out with a million, I end up with a million. In other words, my that's my trading stock account. My purchases for that month, stock is replaced in the same month of the sale, equals my cost of sales for that month. Stock is replaced in the same month of the sale. So I have my purchases, but I don't have my cost of sales. Why do I need my cost of sales? Because my, my cost of sales, yes, so I'm buying stock here, okay? But let's say I'm buying, uh, let me say, 400,000 rands worth of stock. I'm selling 400 rands worth of stock. My purchases then equals my cost of sales. Once I have my cost of sales, I can work out my payments to creditors. Okay, this year is total purchases. This is that is total purchases. So by saying sorry, sorry, sorry. Eighty percent of stock bought is cash, so twenty percent is on credit. The only information I can work out is my cost of sales, because cost of sales, like I said, equals purchases, or purchases equals cost of sales. So I'm going to work backwards from sales to cost of sales. Why? Because I have my total sales, and that's why they gave me total sales. So I'm going to use my total sales, okay? I'm going to times my total sales to work out my cost of sales. Then I'm going to convert my total sales into cost of sales, which is then going to equal my purchases. Right, so you're with me. Let's go again. Creditors are paid in the second month after the sale. I must work out payments to creditors for July. My July payments is based on purchases that I made two months ago. So I go back to June and I go back to May, May, June, July. So the items I bought in May, I'm going to pay in July. So I go back two months and I go to my May total sales. Okay, so let's do that quickly. I go to my May, May total sales, which is 962, and I'll explain to you why I do that. And I'm going to times it by 70, no, by 100, sorry, times it by 100 over 175. Okay, I'm going to times that by 100 over 175. So it's 962, 500 times 100 divided by 175, and I'm going to get 550,000. That is my cost of sales. Okay, that is my cost of sales there. That, that there, and that there is the same amount. Cost of sales equals purchases. 
cost of sales equals purchases. Now that I have my purchases, I can say, okay, that's my total purchases times 20% equals my credit purchases, 110,000 credit purchases. So my credit purchases for May, I'm going to pay in July. Okay, so I'm tracking back. I go to my sales for May to work out my cost of sales for May. My cost of sales for May equals my purchases for May, total purchases. I take my total purchases for May, I times it by 20% to work out credit purchases for May, which I pay to creditors in July. And that, learners, is how you work out payments to creditors. 